You know, that song is kind of profound when you think about it. God was able to create the world, everything you see. But he's still working on us. Shows you what kind of a case we are, doesn't it? I got to admit, nothing makes my heart drop any more than when someone gets up and says, we're going to do something outside of the box today. <laughs> it does. Like, oh, no. <laughs> there was nobody, people are going to quit coming now. And, and so that was great, though. Wonderful. Thank you. Did that, did that scare anybody else when somebody does that? All right. So uh, anyway, you'll notice the title of the message today. Is, it, it should say the normalization of deviance. I kind of put it in there wrong. I put the uh, normalcy of deviance, but it's normalization of deviance. To make you wonder about what that's going to be about, right? We'll, we'll get into it. Um, it's been a blessing being here so far today. And good to see I got to see some people I haven't seen before. Praise the Lord. Um, I want to read a scripture as we begin. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11. And your Bible says this, because a sentence against the evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Though a sinner do evil a hundred times and his days are prolonged, yet surely I know that it is well for them that fear God, which fear before him. So even though you're doing evil and you think things are going well, the Bible says that might be the case, but it's still going to be better for those that are faithful to him. And uh, I, was, I was actually, the, the idea from this message, I was actually going in a completely different direct, direction. I have a different message that I feel like God has laid on my heart. That'll be another time. But I was talking to David uh, Wilkins this week uh, about it, and he's like, oh, he gives me this, tells me a little something about this whole idea of normal, normalization of deviance. I was like, oh, that fits perfectly with the message I had, but it makes it too long. And so um, I really feel like uh, maybe, maybe we'll have a couple of messages here where God is actually, even scripturally, God deals with just how we are as people. Like he made us, right? So he knows how we are, how we think, and the way we operate. And actually illustrates biblically, many places, the consequences, if you will, or, or, if, or the lack there, thereof sometimes when he doesn't punish or he does punish for certain areas. And then the results, how we tend to act as a result of God's action toward us. Is that making sense? Maybe it will as we move along. I want to back up all the way to the very beginning. Adam and Eve. In the beginning, God had warned them, you know, don't take of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They did. And the consequences were immediate, weren't they? I mean, God comes in the garden in the cool of the day right afterward, and he says, huh, this, this can't be. Um, you know, you guys have sinned. You've, you've done, done wrong. The consequences will now be death. And, and the Bible actually says you're now removed from the tree of life. That's what it says. I've got to remove you from the tree of life, lest you live forever. Basically, as sinners. Genesis 3 says that. That's the reason they had to leave the Garden of Eden. The reason they had to leave the Garden of Eden was to be removed from the Tree of Life. Are you aware of that? That's what the Bible says. Okay? The, the consequences were immediate. Okay? The punishment was immediate. But then the very next scenario you find in the Bible, I find this kind of interesting how this plays out after this. It gives us an idea how we are as humans. Um, Cain kills his brother Abel without immediate consequences. Let, let me read about it, okay? God comes down to Cain. He says, where's your brother Abel? And he, Abel says, or Cain says, I don't know. I'm my brother's keeper, mocking his brother's occupation as a, as a keeper of the sheep, right? And he says, Where, where's he at? And he said, I don't know. And he says, well, his blood's crying out from the ground, and, and so now you're going to be punished. But Cain protests his punishment. Now, I'm going to pick it up. In Genesis chapter 4, in verse 10, listen to what happens. And he said, what hast thou done? And your voice, your brother's blood cries out from the ground. I'm sorry, a little bit back, a little bit back too far. And, and, and he said, now you are cursed. God says to Cain, you are cursed from the earth, which has opened her mouth to receive your brother's blood from, the, from, uh, from thy hand. When you till the ground, it shall not henceforth yield thee their strength, and a fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. So you're going to be a wanderer in the earth. Not going to have any place you're really calling home, and, and the earth's not going to give its give its uh, uh, abundance to its growing like it used to for you. So that's what you're going to be. Cain protests the judgment. Listen to what it says. Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face, of, uh, and, and from thy face shall I be hid. And it shall be, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that everyone that finds me shall kill me. He said, like, 
now that you've, you've driven me away, people are going to see me as cursed by you and that like, you don't really care about me, is his argument. And now someone's going to find me and they're going to kill me. So he protested God and says, that's not fair. And so God changes the punishment in some way, or doesn't really change the punishment, but he says this, The Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever will slay Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark upon Cain, lest anyone that found him should kill him. So, so God puts this mark on Cain, protecting him, and says, If you kill Cain, whatever happens to him, I'm going to put it upon you seven times worse. So he would protect Cain in that way. So Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, and he dwelt in Nod, in the uh, east of Eden. Now what's interesting about that is, is that, was in, that was back in verse 16. Now go with me down to verse 23, and this is where we're going to start getting into the, I think, what, what was the interesting concept that we're going to bring out today from the Word of God, uh, the consequences of, of not having punishment. The consequences of not having punishment. Look what happens in verse 23. It says, So Lamech, he was a descendant of Cain, right? said to his two wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, you wise of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech, for I have killed a man that wounded me, and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy-sevenfold. So Lamech, this, this, this descendant of Cain, he, he realizes that, his, that, his, that Cain had killed his brother Abel, and God really didn't do any harm to him, sent him out as a vagabond, you know, as a wanderer, but promised him special protection that if anybody touches him, seven times worse will be upon them. He has a descendant coming along, Lamech, and he says, look, I've killed these guys, and, and, and if, if God's going to protect Cain for killing, he's going to protect me too. I'm, I'm, I can get away with it just fine. As a matter of fact, I believe God will protect me 77-fold. Isn't that interesting? He, in other words, because God didn't strike down Cain with death for killing Abel, it's just a generation goes, not even a generation here goes by. I mean, just a few verses in your Bible, you have this next individual thinking, it's perfectly fine, I killed somebody, and now God's going to protect me too. And it only goes downhill from there. I want you to notice what takes place after that. Things went down pretty fast. If you get to Genesis chapter 6, it says, God saw the wickedness of, was great upon the earth. This is Genesis 6, 5, if you're following along. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And every imagination and thought of his heart was only evil continually. And so I want to ask the question, why? Why was it that just from Genesis chapter 4, uh, 3, where you find the fall, the Genesis chapter 6, God gets to the place by this time, he's ready to destroy the whole world because every single thought and imagination of the heart was only evil continually. You know, I can't help but to wonder, now I'm not second guessing God, obviously, right? But what do you think the consequences would, would, would have been different if possibly when Adam and Eve sinned, God would have struck them dead and started all over? Right? Or when Cain killed Abel, if God would have struck Cain down and says, if you kill somebody, I'm going to strike you down, what do you think the con how do you think the things would have went by the time we got to Genesis chapter 6? Do you think it's possible it could have been any different? We're going to see that God himself even, even makes this case himself later on. And what I think is interesting about it, because the consequences of their deviation from following God, because the consequences were not immediate, people feel perfectly fine in continuing down that path. And that hasn't changed, as a matter of fact. We're going to see that straight through the Bible, all the way to our day. I mean, you know, really, when we, when, we have a, when we have a message or we're reading from the Word of God, unless we can figure out how this God's applying it to us, it's really, I mean, it's okay sometimes, but the real relevance comes when you and I figure out how it applies to us, doesn't it? And I think this is an interesting thing that takes place here. As a matter of fact, um, it goes on, um, doing wrong, come to the place, according to the text, where doing wrong became the norm. Right? By the time you reach Genesis 6, everyone was doing wicked. As a matter of fact, it goes on and says in verse 6, Genesis 6, 6, It repented the Lord that he made man on the earth. It grieved him in his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and birds of the air, for it repents me that I've made them. What I think is very interesting about that, in other words, there was no immediate consequences for doing wrong, but it was getting to the place when something, uh, the consequences for doing wrong, you're going to get to the place where they were just catastrophic. Right? In, in other words, it wasn't small punishments that were taking place for doing wrong. That God was letting it go. He said, I told you not to do it this way. This is the way I want you to do it. This is what I expect of you. And they ignored what God had said. But by ignoring what God had said, you don't read where God's coming in with immediate punishment. Remember what we read in our, in our opening text too there, by the way. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, 
Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in to do evil. Because God doesn't punish immediately, people think they're getting away with something. Doing wrong became the norm. Deviating from the way of God said became the way of life. That's amazing. After all, it seemed there was no consequences for doing wrong. I like when we get down to, down to Genesis 6.11 because I want you to notice the wording now and we should connect this back to what we just read. Genesis 6.11, it says, The earth was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. The first violent act we read about, Cain kills Abel. The very next act we read about, Lamech kills and says, I'm going to be justified in what I'm doing as well. I'll be protected. And then by the time we get to Genesis 6, it says the earth is then filled with violence. That's kind of interesting what you find is no punishment for doing violent acts in Genesis 1 through 6. You never find, you find God letting you know that it's wrong. He doesn't want you to do this, right? We find God saying these things, but we don't find consequences in Genesis 1 through 6 to finally get to the place where the whole earth is filled with violence. Isn't that interesting? I mean, we, we, want, we, we have this God, this loving God who we worship, and, and he loves us and, and cares for us without a doubt. But God says there is and will be consequences for the evil that is done. But multitudes, even today, feel that since nothing is happening, when I go out and I do something wrong, then God must not really care about it. And we get to the place where we become, it becomes our lifestyle, our thought process, where we, our normal way of life, doing what God has said not to do, thinking because there's no consequences, God must not care. More of that in a moment. But you know, when the consequences did come, they were catastrophic, right? God come to the place here in Genesis 6, they, thought they, were, they, they all thought they were getting away with something. Lamech and Cain and all their descendants, everyone thinks they're getting away with something. They're, they're living outside the will of God, they're living violently, they're killing one another, they're robbing, they're killing, they're doing whatever. The Bible says that they'd come to the place where the earth was filled with violence and very corrupt. And then it says, and God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. So it got to the place where normal life was, was to do exactly the opposite, basically, of what God had said. And this pattern, as they did this, no consequences came, but when consequences finally did came, what were they? They were catastrophic. I mean, we're talking about a deluge killing everybody. It wasn't the occasional daily way they were living their lives. God didn't punish immediately, but did punishment come? <whistles> punishment came. So this pattern is over and over, by the way, throughout the Bible. You see this pattern over and over. Because God does not punish immediately, but God does eventually punish. Right? It's not immediate, but it's eventually. It, it happens eventually. And when I, when I was thinking about the, the idea here, there's this, this term that like David told me about, so I started researching it, called the normalization of of deviance. In other words, what, what happens, and, and, and this is something they studied in, in society, in businesses and companies, and but now that, well, I found out as I was looking through this, it applies to humans in general and in the churches, where because I've done something wrong and there's no immediate consequences, I get the feeling that it must not be wrong after all. And ultimately what ends up happening is when the consequences do come, they're, again, catastrophic. Now, I'm going to read you the definition for this whole idea, because we're going to get into this in more detail and bring it back to the biblical perspective in just a moment, but I want to point out something to you. The definition, normal, normalization of, of deviance, the gradual process, listen to this, the gradual process through which unacceptable practices or standards become acceptable. You, now, notice here that it, it, it comes about like it's a gradual thing to where things that were unacceptable become accepted and normal. As the deviant behavior is repeated without catastrophic results, it becomes the social norm for the organization. Now, this term was first came up with, the idea, it had nothing to do with religion, it had nothing to do with following God, it had to do with totally from, from the uh, uh, social aspect, if you will, and they, they, would, they was researching things. First, when it first came up as a term, what they were researching what happened with like the space shuttles blowing up, right? And but they, then they started applying this and looking at companies and looking at businesses and looking at organizations when they, when they had these big catastrophic failures, how do we get here? Like, how do we get to the place that got this bad, right? And, and um, the, like I said, it first came up with the whole idea of the NASA shuttle. How many people here remember when the, when the space shuttle Challenger broke up in, on, in 1986? How many people remember that? You remember that? I, I was home from school that day. It was January 28th. I was home from school. I think we had a snow day or something. And we had the big satellite dish. 
And uh, we were, I, I happened to be flipping through, you know, I had some friends that are at our house that they just hang out, and I come up across the NASA channel. That's the most boring channel that's ever been invented, right? But the space was sitting there, and they're getting ready to send it up. And you could listen. It had no reporters. All you could do is hear the people on the ground talking to the people in the shuttle back and forth. That's all you could hear on the thing, right? And so the space shuttle takes off, starts going up in the air, and then it, and it comes apart, right? And I, my mom was at work, and I called her. I said, Mom, I just saw the space shuttle blow up. And she goes, oh, I didn't it, like, probably the, Those rocket things come apart, you know. As they, and I said, no, no, it looked like it blew up to me. She goes, no, I don't think that's the case. We didn't know. I there was nobody reporting. But I said, the people on the ground can't talk to the people in the shuttle anymore. Then, of course, it comes across the news that it had blown up. Well, they began to investigate this shuttle. Why did it blow up? And it's very interesting that as they're assessing that, basically for the, for the, the, the booster rockets on the sides of the shuttle, there was these O-rings, these big O-rings that, that for the stages of it to, to seal them, but they couldn't make the thing one big rocket because they, they shipped it from Utah, right? So they broke it, make it up in segments, and then they would put it together and have these O-rings sealing it. And uh, they had found that after some of the flights that these O-rings were damaged a little bit, and they were damaged outside the specs of, of, of acceptable safety. But the people looked at it and they said, wait a minute, we just done this flight, nothing went wrong. Sometimes what we do is, is they would say, is our specs are so tight, you know, we're making, we're, we're so, so strict on things that um, um, we're overboard with it. And I think, I think that this kind of damage, after all, there were two O-rings protecting it, not just one. And, and if one's damaged, the other one's okay. It'll be okay. They sent it up again with the damaged O-ring. Nothing happened. And then they send it up again with a damaged O-ring. Nothing happened, right? And they come to the place where they realize that, you know what? I think this whole idea of making sure that we check these O-rings, making sure they're safe, it's not really that big of a deal. Until the morning of January 28, 1986, the O-ring failed. And it was catastrophic, destroyed everything. The normalization of deviance, they were deviating from what the set standards were in order for safe flight. They deviated from it, but nothing went wrong. So they got the idea that maybe it's not a big deal after all. And you know what was interesting? is in the same um, era of time, just, just uh, to 2003, so basically in, this, in the same kind of generation there, and by the time you get to 2003, you remember the space shuttle Columbia? They found the same thing had happened. Before in the past, they'd have some of, these, the, some of the um, insulator things come apart, you know, on the shuttle launch or whatever, and... Um, I don't know all the details. I just read it here recently. But I'm just giving you an idea of what took place, right? They'd come apart before, but nothing happened. So they thought, it must not going to be causing any problems, any major problems. Well, this time, when it came apart, it destroyed the space shuttle and killed the people again. Instead of fixing the problem when they were small, that it became the normalization of their culture, the culture of the, of the, of the business, if you will, of NASA, to say, this isn't as, as bad as what we said it is. Even in the place where they start training the people that are working on it later, that this is the way you do it even though it's, it's totally wrong from what the original plan was. And it's cost, it cost twice there, both those space shuttles to blow up. And they found this over and over again in organizations all the time who are deviating from normal safe practices. Am I doing right, David? Practices, is that right? I can't see David, he's in the back. Yeah, deviating from normal safe practices because there were no immediate consequences. People so all of a sudden start beginning that, those, that that's okay to deviate from that safe practice to the place where even when they're training the next people to do the job, they train them to do it wrong. And then when, when it's time to pay, I mean, like when, it, when, it, when, it, when things finally do mess up, it's catastrophic. The problem is huge. Um, I was reading, I was like, okay, is this, is this the only two cases? And you find it like, no, you can find case after case after case where people deviate from normal right practices and nothing goes wrong, so they think it's perfectly all right, perfectly safe. Do you see where this is going, by the way? Um, there was another case of, uh, you remember the cruise ship Costa Concordia? That, uh, I see people shaking their head, yes, some crashed off the coast of Italy January 2012. All these things happen in January. Don't travel in January. <laughs> this disaster killed 32 of its 4,252 uh, 4, passengers that were on board. Now, this says the sinking can be attributed to the ne negligence of captain and crew. Their actions were all because of the normalization of deviance in the crew's business. Captain Francesco Cettino first decided to go on an unapproved course because it was tradition for cruise ships to pass the particular closely to the island. Passing closely created a spectacle for the people on the shore. This behavior became the norm, but each captain was deviating from the approved path. In other words, 
that they, this, not, don't go too close to this island. You could hit a reef. You could hit something and sink. Well, one guy did it, and going close like that, it, the people on shore really loved that, and there were people who would come down to watch the ships and everything. So everybody got to where they were, they were deviating off course, drawing closer to the island, so everybody would get that little thrill seeing the boats come by or whatever, right? They thought this was great. But they were deviating from what the approved path of safety was. And since nothing went wrong, guess what? It must be okay. Until finally, one guy got a little too close. And he hit shore, and the boat sank. You know, and like he goes to jail over this, and it's what's interesting about this whole thing is, you ready for this? Everybody's doing it. Everybody was doing it, and there were no consequences. <coughs> Very interesting. The Bible brings up these points in a, in a more detailed manner than what I'm doing here about the way we live our lives. I, I'm, I'm going to tell you real quickly. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, some of you know this. I, I'm a pilot, right? I'm going to tell you a, a quick little story here. Um, I was flying with my dad and another guy in, in an airplane, a Beechcraft Sundowner, from Columbus, Ohio, down to Portsmouth, Ohio, where he kept a plane. My dad and, my, and myself and another guy was kind of in a club on this little airplane. And uh, we were flying down on the left tank, on the right tank. We were flying down on the right tank. And we landed in Circleville, Ohio, to fuel up. And we landed there, we switched to the left tank, filled up the right tank, and flew on home. The next day, two days later, I go to fly the airplane. Now, there's something that you have to do before you fly the airplane every time. It's called, come on, somebody, pre-flight. You, you look the airplane over. One of the things you do, and, you, and, and it, sometimes it's so like, there's no way I, 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 like, I just flew the airplane two days ago. The, nothing could be wrong, but you look at all these things over and over, right? One of the things you do is you got this little fuel strainer, and you stick it up into, un, underneath the wing where the gas tank is, right, and drain some of the gas out of the tank about this much in a cup, right? And you look at it to make sure that the gas is clean, right? If there's dirt and particles in there, something wrong. You don't want dirt and particles going into your, into your fuel line because if you're flying and dirt and particles get in your fuel line, it can make for a very, very bad day, right? And so you always check these things. No matter what, you do the pre-flight over and over. Now, I've known individuals they call it so monotonous. It's their airplane. They fly it day after day after day that they don't go out and pre-flight it before they fly. They just kind of get in it and go, Right? Well, I, went, I never got in that habit. I want to I be thankful that I never got into the normalization of deviance when it comes to this. I went out to go check that airplane that day, and I went and stick the strainer up under, and get up under the wing, because it got to get up under the low wing, got to get up under it, and I stick it up under there, and it comes out. It's about that much. That it, it's, look, you ever seen oil and water when you put it in the same thing, how it separates? Well, water will do that with fuel, too. And <laughs> it was like that much fuel and that much water and dirt. That place we got the, the tank filled up in Circleville, Ohio, when they put it in the tank, they put water and gas mixture in our fuel. Come to find out, they got this truck they hadn't used in a while, this fuel truck, and they didn't clean it out first, and, it was, and they filled up with fuel, but there was water in it, right? And uh, now the thing is, if I had taken off on that tank, because I would have switched to the tank when I got ready to take off, we had about, you know, it's going to switch back to the other tank, I would have flown for just a little bit before everything got run through the lines, and then it would have quit at a very in inconvenient altitude. And I wouldn't be standing here today, right? But it's interesting that I, I'm like, oh, well, that's perfect because I actually I don't want to fall in. None of us need to fall into the, to the um, cycle of normalization of deviance. Deviating from what we know to be right and true, deviating from that can lead to catastrophic results. By the way, even that very day, I could have taken off, flown the airplane, and landed it, and nothing would have went wrong possibly if I'd have kept it on the left tank. And then later on, I could have found out there's, there was water in the fuel, but I got away with it, so it must be okay, right? Do you understand how the process goes? By the way, God had things put in place because he knows how we are to make sure that you and I don't fall into, the, fall into that, that idea of the normalization of deviance. By the way, it's been found in almost every case study of major catastrophic failures. The major catastrophic failures were always, almost without exception, every time due us as humans not following what we know to be right. Right? You go and they go investigate crashes, right? What what happened in the crash? And well, nine times out of ten they'll say pilot error, right? But oftentimes what happens in a crash, like of an airplane or something like that, is nothing more than we got so used to doing things wrong that never had any consequences that we think it's perfectly fine to continue in that direction. It happens in people's workplaces all the time. I mean, I used to work on forklifts. And they would, they would make us do these safety videos and stuff, and they would show, and they would tell stories about guys. And 
One of the things he's able to have you do is, is when you're working on the, on the uh, mast, with the thing that rises, that takes the forklifts, the forks way up in the air, you know, when you're working on that mast, if you're working on it, to make sure you put blocks, wood blocks in there, clamp them to the mast, so if anything goes wrong, hydraulic line messes up or something like that, and it starts down, it stops on that wood block rather than going all the way down and killing somebody, right? But, you know, there was a guy that, in, in a company I worked for who was working on those without the blocks in there and had his arms through the mast and it came down. They was able to put his arms back together, basically, but he's, he, he, was not, he didn't have full action of use of them anymore. Basically, we'd worked on it before without having to do that, so nothing went wrong. Every catastrophic event, they find that. And it's amazing because it happens spiritually. Normalization of deviance strikes society and strikes the church. How does that hap- happen? When deviant behavior becomes so common that convincing people that it's wrong becomes almost impossible. You know, if I, if I walk in there and see the guy working on it, a senior technician working on the forklift, I say, no, 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 you need to block that. You know what he said? You know what he would say, right? Don't tell me what to do. I've been doing this for years. This is the way I always do it. <laughs> it's, it's really kind of an amazing process. It happens in the church, right? People practice things that they know God's word says not to do, and because God doesn't strike them with lightning, must be okay. My grandparents did it this way. My parents did it this way becomes normal, the normalization of deviance. It strikes even in the church. When deviant behavior becomes so common that convincing people that it's wrong is almost impossible, after all, there's not been consequences. And because the consequences are not immediately negative, we begin to think the action must be okay. However, when the consequences come, they are catastrophic, even in the church. You know, I, I think it's funny, you know, like to think about some of these stories in the Bible. Remember the story whenever the Philistines had captured the Ark of God? And they started having like hemorrhoid problems and and all and mice uh, over uh, infestation, this kind of stuff. And they thought, was it is it God doing this to them? Is it the Hebrew God doing this, or is it coincidence? And so what they did is they got this brand new cart. Remember that? And they put the Ark of God on the cart, and they and they sent the cart away uh, with with the with the cows, and it went away. And it, and the Hebrews received it. Remember that taking place? Okay. Well, then remember when the Hebrews decide they want to move the cart, how did they move the Ark of the Covenant? How, they, how did they move it? We went over this not too long ago in the sermon, right? They put on a brand new cart. Remember that? And they start sending the cart away, and the, the, the ox stumbles, and the cart tumbles a little bit, and it looks like the Ark of the Covenant is going to fall over it, and Uzzah reaches out to steady it, and God strikes him dead. Remember that? Now, how did they move the Ark when they finally decide to move it after that? <laughs> they done everything right, right? They, because it was not supposed to be put on an ark. It was, supposed to be, it was supposed to be carried by the sons of Kohath, right? The priest the people were supposed to carry it with the sticks, the poles through the ark, carried on their shoulders, walk along. And if they'd been doing that like they were supposed to do it, everything would have been fine. But they were doing it, hey, it was sin here like this, must be okay. And they went along a little ways like that, everything must be fine. But then all of a sudden, the party gets ruined with a catastrophic failure of Uzzah dropping dead because he reached out to study the ark. Do you understand what's going on there? They thought what they were doing was perfectly safe, but they were deviating from the word of God. Oh, there's so many examples. God had actually set up institutions all throughout the Old Testament when he was um, when they were operating under a theocracy. When they were operating under his theocracy, God had set up all kinds of ways to make sure that the children of Israel, God's people, never fell into the trap of the normalization of deviance. Let me give you some examples. Now, I'm not saying we need to be doing these things now, but what I'm going to point out to, and I want you to ask yourselves, are the things that I'm going to read to you about what God would punish, as God would punish immediately in the, in the Old Testament times, are these things any less offensive to God today? Okay? God established his theocracy during the time of Moses. You remember that? And he gives directions on how to prevent society from becoming normalizi- normalization of deviance. And here's what he did. If a, ch- if a child got out of hand and you couldn't control your kid, you know, what, you know what God said to do? Stone them. As a matter of fact, let me read you what God's word says. Listen to this. Now, of course we would never do this, but I want you to think about what God's doing here. He actually tells you what he's doing. Follow this. Deuteronomy 21, verse 18. Deuteronomy, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. 21 and verse 18 is where we're beginning. Okay? The Bible says this. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, he will still not listen to them. So they've tried to punish him, they've punished him, and he just, he's just hard-hearted, hard-headed. 
Then shall his father and his mother lay hold upon him, bring him out of the elders of the city, unto the gate of this place, and they shall say unto the elders of the city, This is our son, he's stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice, he's a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of the city shall stone him with stones, that he die, so that you put evil away from him among you. Now listen to these next words. And all of Israel shall hear and fear. So what was God's prescribed plan to, to keep us from having a society where the children all grew up all disobeying their parents? All you have to do is take one of them out, <laughs> right? And God says, stone them with stones till they die, and everyone will hear and fear. In other words, that won't happen anymore, right? And you, you, we think, oh, that's just terrible, that's rotten. But I want you to think about something, like this, this process here. What would it make the others think? One is lost, but how many saved? Right? Now, I'm not prescribing in any way. Don't, don't get me wrong. Not prescribing in any way. We try, try that. Uh, you know, like, oh, he, hear ye, hear ye, all you youngins. If you don't obey your parents, we're going to bring you here in front of the church and give you a lashing. Anybody want to bring their kids up today? And, and, but the idea is, the, don't say yes. The, the idea is, there is the, there, what he's doing is God has given an example. In other words, they were, he doesn't want them to get used to the idea that it's okay with me. Because God's not punishing immediately. By the way, we never have an example in the Bible that's ever happening. Right? I remember, I, I told you before, I said, I, I don't think, I don't have any memory of my parents ever whipping me, but I had no doubt the threat was there. <laughs> right? And so we have no examples that's ever happening. Apparently, you know, the threat was good enough. But now follow this. Children out of hand, God said, stone them. How about the next one? Blasting the name of God. Stone them. Listen to this story. Leviticus 24, verse 10. And the son of an Israelitish woman, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the children of Israel, and this son of the Israelitish woman and a man of Israel strove together in the camp. And the Israelitish woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed, and they brought him unto Moses. And they put him in ward, that means in jail, that the mind of the Lord might be showed them. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Bring forth him that has cursed without the camp, and let all that heard him lay their hands upon his head, and let all the congregation stone him with stones. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Whosoever curseth his father, I mean, I'm sorry, curseth his God, shall bear his sin. And he that blasphemes the name of the Lord, and he shall surely be put to death. And all the congregation shall certainly stone him, and all as well as the stranger, as he that is born in the land. When he blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. You know what's interesting about that story, by the way? There's no record of it ever happening again. In other words, God has dilemmas, and he can imagine his dilemmas. If, if, if He has the example written back in the book of Genesis there where he didn't do anything. One killed another, he didn't do anything. They blasphemed him, they didn't do anything. He just let it go, right? And what was the natural consequence? What was the, what was the ultimate result of that, of that taking place? Yeah, and finally the flood comes. He has to destroy everything because people got to the place where since God's not doing anything immediately right now, it must be okay to act this way. <laughs> and so, if he, and so you can imagine this dilemma God has. He wants to save everybody, doesn't he? So if he comes and he, and he strikes everybody dead every time they sin, <laughs> there'd be none of us left, right? But, you know, as if, if he were doing these things like, like he struck us a dead and, he, and these things were being fulfilled, wouldn't you think twice before you haphazardly took God's name in vain? How about you youngins? Would you think twice before you told your parents to shove it? Would it make you think twice about it if, if the punishment came, like, like what was mentioned here, right? But, but if he doesn't punish like this, then what's the result? If God doesn't punish immediately, what becomes, what becomes the, what's the idea in the church? The deviation, um, the normalization of deviation. In other words, you, we deviate from God's word because, after all, he's not doing anything to us. What a dilemma God has. But you know what we're going to teach here and we're going to learn from the Bible? He is going to punish and it's going to be catastrophic. No one's getting away with anything. How about this one? Break the Sabbath? Stone them. <laughs> right? Here it is. Numbers 15, 32. While the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks on the Sabbath. By the way, God had just told them not to be out working on the Sabbath. I mean, he just said that. It's, it's not like there, 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 there's this time had gone by and, and, and people had forgotten. He had just said it. Have you ever had this, parents, by the way? Have you ever had this? Don't do that. And 10 minutes later, they're doing what you said don't do? It's not like you told them a year ago, maybe they'd forgotten. It was 10 minutes? How much stricter is your punishment, by the way, if it's 10 minutes than one year? 
right? If you, if you haven't told them in a year, you're a little more lenient, right? If you told them 10 minutes ago, I'm ready to take them before the elders. But it says, And they found him gathering sticks. They brought him to Moses and to Aaron and to all, all the congregation. Um, and they put him in ward because it was not declared what should be done to him. Put him in jail also. The Lord said unto Moses, The man shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him, brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones, and he died as the Lord commanded Moses. You see, understand this dilemma God has? If he doesn't do anything, if he lets this go and doesn't do anything, what's happening six months from then? Everybody's doing it, disobeying God. And then who, who does he have to punish? Like he gets to the place, he says, I can't let this go on. I can't let it go on indefinitely. I cannot allow people to indefinitely walk in this line of, line of sin and that, that lifestyle. Why? Because you see the results. You know the results of God. And, and so God has this, I think, I think it's a dilemma God has, you know. Do I let them continue in this lifestyle, in this behavior, or do I put a check to it? Putting a check to it means I have to get your attention. And what's the only way God really gets your attention? You know, it's interesting to me how many people I run into that has nothing to do with God until they're about to die. Right? I mean, it has to do something to get our attention, right? <laughs> Commit adultery? Stone them. Leviticus 20, verse 10, And the man that commits adultery with another man's wife, even he that commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall both be put to death. Man, that was hard, wasn't it? But can you imagine that perhaps... There was a time when people thought twice about committing some of these things. By the way, my friends, God knows that if he doesn't get bring things like that in check and just lets it go on continually, what's the result of the society? What happens? Everybody is living a life. I mean, it becomes who we are. We become, we become normalized to deviance. God's not doing anything. must be okay. Incidentally, I'm going to just give you some of the things. Here, here's some of the things that God's word had said in the Old Testament under the theocracy. Now, the, one of the reasons, remember Jesus said, he is without sin cast the first stone. Keep in mind that by the time we get into the time of Christ even, they were no longer under a theocracy. God didn't come down and say, oh, put him in jail. Um, Moses goes talk to God and say, God, what do you want to do with it? And God's voice says, Moses, stone them with stones. That's different, right? So we, we understand we, we don't practice these things. But what I also want to understand, and I want you to ask you this question, and I hope it sinks down in our hearts just a little bit this morning. Afternoon? Is God any less offended by these actions? I mean, because we no longer take people out that commit adultery and stone them with stones, because if someone breaks the Sabbath, we don't take them out and beat them to death, right? Because someone pr practices any of these sins, do we, do we um, whether it be uh, taking God's name in vain, um, <laughs> your children acting up, because we don't kill you for that anymore, is it any more pleasing or less pleasing to God? No, it's still sin. And ultimately, my friends, just like in this uh, the idea of what happens when people become normalized to deviance, when the, when, when the consequences come, how do they come? Catastrophic. Everybody gets it at once, right? It's not that we're getting away with anything. But here's some of the list of things. For murder, God says kill them, Exodus 20. Bestiality, people having relations with animals, Leviticus 20, verse 15, kill them for that. Rape, kill them. Homosexuality, Leviticus 18, 22, and Leviticus 20, verse 13. It says, if a man lies with a man as he lies with a woman, kill them both. Worship of other gods, kill them. Witchcraft, practice witchcraft, kill them. Cursing a parent, kill them. Kidnapping, kill them. We never think about doing that. I mean, it wouldn't even cross our mind. It shouldn't cross your mind today. But what I want us to understand from the biblical perspective, what was God doing when he was setting up that, that organization with a, with, under his theocracy? What was he doing? He was putting us, the people, in the mindset of don't make the mistake of thinking that being deviant, de uh, going away from my, what I say is truth, what I say is right, don't think that by going away from that, you're getting away with anything. There has to be consequences. And the consequences were immediate, and it kept them safe. Honestly. Have you ever thought about it? Get angry and cuss and take God's name in vain? Have you ever thought about it? If, 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 if the case was like when you did that, you were going to be struck down and killed, do you think you would have done it? <laughs> you would have thought about it, right? My friends, if we're not repenting of these things, these very things, it's going to happen, again, only in a catastrophic manner. 
are these things any less offensive to God now than they were then? I mean, I'm thankful that the God we serve, and he's patient and long-suffering, and he'll forgive us if we ask forgiveness, right? So thankful for that. But he has demonstrated in his word what happens when he says nothing and does nothing. What's the, what's the ultimate consequence? When God says nothing and does nothing, what ultimately happens? The flood, right? And then he goes through a period of time when he sets up his people and he says, look, these are the consequences. This is what's going to happen if you do that. And it kept them in check for a while, right? But now we come to the place again, even in the time we're living, where God isn't striking us down for doing these things, right? We're not taking people out and stoning them. But what's happening, what's taking place, even among the church, is the normalization of deviance where because there's no consequences, we begin to think it's perfectly fine. But the consequences will come. We come to we make deviant behavior the norm. And make things that God says are not. Right? Deviant behavior has become the norm. I think there is in society and quickly permeating in church the idea that things aren't so bad because there are no immediate consequences for the wrongs being done. As a matter of fact, the push for tolerance instead of obedience is what we're, what's prevalent in our church and society. I come up with a quote. Are you ready for my quote? Tolerance is going to be seen as the last remaining virtue of a depraved society. I mean, that, that's where we are, right? Tolerance. We, we tolerate everything. This is the way I am. Tolerate it. Isn't that true? And, that, and that's this virtue that everybody's pushing, even in the church. We accept everything. Everything's okay, right? You've heard that? I'm afraid of that. I'm afraid that, that what takes place, what's taking place, God's word says things are a certain way. This is the way they are. This is the way I expect you to go. And But because God isn't coming down and striking us dead, many of us think we're getting away with something. I like, well, what are a list of other virtues? You know, virtues are things like accountability, benevolence, bravery, devotion, faithfulness, gratitude, humility, loyalty. Tolerance is a virtue. But it's the last virtue of a depraved society. <laughs> They've gotten rid of the others, bravery, devotion, faithfulness. <laughs> Those are going by the wayside, huh? Accountability. <laughs> no one's accountable for anything. Benevolence, ah, loyalty. But let's make sure that we're tolerant. God actually predicts that in the last part of this earth's history, that that will become the norm. That deviation from God's truth deviation from what God would have us do will become normal. He actually predicts that would be the case, which I think is very interesting. It's like we discovered, 20th century, this human, human nature thing called the normalization of deviance, where we find that if there's no consequences immediately, we begin to practice things we shouldn't. And it starts from the, from the very early parts of our lives all the way to the end of our lives. How many of you here, don't raise your hand, have worked for a company that you're doing things at the company a, a, as far as the work goes, you know it's not right, but you've gotten away with it and it didn't hurt anything, so you continue to do it. You ever had that happen? God knows. Long, we just discovered this, by the way. <laughs> it's like 20th century, right? We just discovered this idea, this normalization of deviance, but God knew that that's the way it was, and he's demonstrated it throughout the scriptures all the way up from, to, from the beginning to our time. He shows what happens when he does nothing, and he shows what happens when he, when, he, when he does something. And when he does something, is always much better than when he does nothing. Does that make sense? But what phase are we in right now? We're in a phase right now where every one of us, if we're not careful, if we're not looking at God's word and letting that be the standard, the rule, can find ourselves deviating from the truths of God's word. Normally. <laughs> I've actually had people. I've actually had people. I said, um, you know what? It's a sin to go out and eat on Sabbath. I'll say that. I can show it from the Bible. Not made servant man servant working for you on the Sabbath. What it says, right? And he, even in, even in um, Nehemiah chapter 13, they were, they were buying and selling on the Sabbath food and stuff from Gentiles. And God says, stop that. Or he sent his prophet to say, stop that, Nehemiah. And they, and they continued to do it anyway. And Nehemiah says, if you do it again, I'm going to beat you up. That's what it says. And they stopped doing it, right? And, and, but anyway, I, I've, I've actually mentioned to people, I said, you know what, that's sinful to do that. We shouldn't be doing that. That's, that's what God, but everyone is doing it. Deviation from God's word has become the norm. Everyone's doing it, and we justify it. Because God hasn't come down and struck me dead. Very interesting. And I actually hear this. I, I, love, this, I love this terminology. I say, well, I'm just more liberal than you. 
Have you ever heard somebody say that? I'm more liberal than you. You're, you're conservative. I'm liberal, so I go out in the on Sabbath. You don't. You're, that's fine. You don't do it. You're conservative. I'm a liberal. As if we're all going to heaven together. My friends, it's not a matter of liberal and conservative issues. It's a matter of biblically right or biblically wrong. But what's happening, and I, I want to I wanna warn us, and I just, I'm like, it's a terrifying thing when I think about it. Well, all of us should consider it. Could it be that we come to the place where deviation from God's truth is such a normal thing that we don't find it as wrong anymore? I'm not guilty. It's, everybody does it. <laughs> I was down in Florida. I'm going to pick on the Floridians, right? I was down there, and what was the, what was the name of that, that, that academy church I, that we were at? Help me out, Laura. Forest Lake Academy. Down the street from Forest Lake Academy, there's a place called Sweet Tomatoes. You can't get in there on Sabbath. All the Gentiles can't get in there. Everybody leaves church and goes down to eat. And I was preaching down there one time. And I said, hey, listen, folks, if you're going to do that, when you go into the restaurant, don't leave literature. I mean, what are you going to do? If your server gets your literature and they read it and they're convicted and converted, they won't be working there anymore. Where are you going to go eat? Do you understand the point? The normalization of deviance. In other words, now, I, I'm just picking on that. I can pick on lots of things if you want me to. We all fall into it. My question is, you and I in our relationship to God, do we want to continue down a path where we deviate from God, what God's word says, and it becomes so normal that everybody's doing it? Can we deviate, can we do that and be perfectly fine? We've been studying our Sabbath school lesson, you know, walking in the spirit or walking in the flesh, right? Walking in the flesh is a life of, of loving obedience to God. Walking in the spirit is it's loving obedience to God. And I find this, like, when David showed this to me this week, I was like, oh, like, thank you. That's so, it's so relevant, right? We can come to the place where it's normal to deviate, normal to do from what God's word says, wrong from what God's word says, and by doing so, we feel perfectly fine and smug because, as a matter of fact, I see other people doing it. Well, yeah, I saw Laura do it. Laura does, must be okay, right? No, Laura can sin too. I know, I've never seen her. But you understand, understand what, we're, what we're talking about. Laura's my wife, in case you didn't know. Right? <laughs> Mi esposa. <laughs> right? And, and so um, the, the, the question is, like, because others are doing it, you know what we tend to start, tend to start doing? I mean, I saw, her, I saw Judy do it, and she didn't, get, she didn't die. Is it okay? Could we get to the place where you and I, instead of living for God, living to fulfill his His fulfill his will in our lives, our living deviant lifestyles, I know, or deviation from, from what he would have us do, but because there's no immediate consequences, we feel perfectly safe and fine. Could we be deceived into thinking everything's okay when it's not? God predicted it would be this way, by the way. In 2 Timothy, I'm going to finish with these texts here, maybe. 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 4. The Bible says this, 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 4. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. I like how this is worded, by the way. When's this going to take place? At his coming, right? In other words, the punishment isn't happening all along, but it is going to happen. It's going to be catastrophic when it happens. He says to us, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. You know what that means? Preach God's word even if it's not popular. In season, it's popular. Out of season, it's not popular, right? How many people here have killed a deer out of season? Don't raise your hand, right? But when it's in season, it's okay, right? So eat, whether it's okay or not okay, he says preach the word. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Now listen to this. In the future, the time will come when they, the people, will not endure sound doctrine. For after their own lust, they'll heap themselves teachers having itchy ears. In other words, the people are going to be getting themselves teachers that will tell them what they want to hear. Tell them that it's okay. Tell them that it's fine. In other words, they're going to be living... A deviant lifestyle, going to be living outside of God's word, will and God's word, right? Going to be living outside of that, but they don't want to hear the truth, so they're going to get people that will tell them what they want to hear. God predicts that will be the, the case in the end. In other words, God was predicting the normalization of deviance at the end. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine and get themselves teachers having itchy ears. They will turn their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables. That's what God predicts. You know if God predicts something, it'll come to pass? What should we be expecting right now in this time in earth's history? For most of us, for the multitudes, I don't want to hear that the direction I'm going is not the right direction. My friends, the wonderful thing about God is he'll let you repent. I think it's wonderful God doesn't strike us dead right now, but my friends, I want you to think, because he's not striking you dead now, he cannot tolerate that in his kingdom. We must repent and turn to him. 
He will forgive only if we ask. But if our lifestyle, if the way we live our lives, if the way we practice our, our faith in God, if the way we practice our, our I'm going to say religion, I know people don't like to use that term today, if the way you practice your relationship with God is in deviance to what his, his um, uh, revealed will is, will he accept us? It's pretty clear no. He says it over and over. Ah, it's not too far past. I'm going to go to Jeremiah 44 for a second. Sorry. When she gets over and sits down, it's time for me to get done. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. All right. Hey, real quick, Jeremiah chapter 44. I got two people to give me signs now, Laura and her. <clears throat> but I want to bring this out, this one last one here, okay? In Jeremiah chapter 44, I, I really feel like this, I, I want to just, um, for all of us, for the sake of all of us, understand like uh, the God's perspective on these things, right? And, and what, he, what he wants us to see. And there's one more story that really lays this out. Um, God's people had been kind of turned away from God, and they were, they were worshiping like the Egyptians again, right? In Jeremiah 44. And uh, in verse 13, it says, I will punish them that dwell in the land of Egypt, and I, uh, as I have punished Jer- Jerusalem by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence, so that none of the remnant of Judah, which are gone into the land of Egypt, so God's people were still in Egypt, right? And they were practicing like the Egyptians. None of them that go the sojourn there shall escape or remain, that they should return unto the land of Judah, to which they have a desire to return to dwell there, for none shall return, but such as shall escape. And so Jeremiah now is preaching to the people. I want you to listen to what's said here. Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense to other gods, and all the women that stood by a great multitude, even all the people the land of, that dwelt in the land of Egypt, in Petros, answered Jeremiah, saying, I like this, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we're not going to listen to you. I've often said that, you know, this is the pastor's book. Right? The book of Jeremiah, you can read the whole book from cover to cover, Jeremiah, from, uh, all the way through, and you don't find one place where one person ever listened to one thing Jeremiah had to say. And Jeremiah comes, he says, God's word said this, and what, what was the people's answer? What was the church's answer? We don't care what God says. How can you get to that point? How can you get to the point where the people of God come to the place they don't care what God says? Terrible? Is that what I heard? It's terrible. How do they get there? Look what happens. But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goes forth out of our own mouth, to burn incense to the queen of heaven, to pour out our drink offerings unto her, as we have done, we and our fathers and our kings and our princes in the city of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of food and we saw no evil. As long as we were living this way, God did not punish us, so it must be okay. They had come to the place where they lived their lifestyle so far away from what God's revealed will was that when the prophet came along and says, you guys are doing wrong, they said, you are a nut. Do you think that could happen again? Do you think it would get to the place where, where, where we, get so far, we go so far from the revealed will of God that you and I get so far from that that when God comes and reveals his truth to us and says, you need to turn to this, you and I say, I don't care what you say, I'm blessed when I act like this and do this. That's what happened. If you read the rest of the story, it doesn't, it doesn't end well for them. <laughs> and my friends, the rest of the story for us, very simple. If we'll turn to God, things will end well. But if we continue down a path of deviance, if we continue down a direction that we know that God has not given us or we, you know, he's revealed to us, if we continue down that direction thinking it's okay because we're not being punished immediately, destruction. <laughs> you don't know how best to say it. Does that make sense today? Kind of a harsh, mean-sounding sermon, wasn't it? But my friends, I think that we need to be concerned about eternal life. And what God's Word has said is still true to this day. Listen, the things that he says that were offensive to him in the Bible, when you read those, they're still offensive today. And instead of practicing a deviant lifestyle, let's surrender our hearts to him. Let's put it in his hands and say, Lord, please, you know my heart. Lord, you know my my defects, you know my faults, please forgive me and lead me into the way to everlasting life. That was prayed by many people in the Bible, and God will always answer that prayer. I want to make a little bit of an appeal to you. You don't have to get up, you don't have to stand up, you don't have to walk forward, you don't do anything like that. But if you're living a deviant lifestyle, what I mean by that is if 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 your normalization of your life is outside of what God is telling us is true, and you feel like you're justifying yourself by showing up at church sometimes or being doing nice things to other people, 
I want to appeal to you today to come to God. Ask him to show you what it is and to give you victory over it. He will. You know, sometimes I think our prayer needs to be, God, some of these things that I find attractive, make them repulsive. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you're so good to us. We have so many examples from your word that shows us what happens. The warnings that you give to us out of love when we live and practice our lifestyle outside of your revealed will. Lord, we know that there's nothing we can do in ourselves to make ourselves righteous, to make ourselves good. But Father, we also know that your will is for us to be good, to live righteous lives, to serve you out of love. Lord, we can't do it upon our own. I pray for your strength and your power. But Lord, most of all, I pray that you'll give us the gift of repentance, that we will, we will be willing to admit that we've been living in normalization of deviance, we, like our normal lives in, oh, out of your will. Lord, we repent for that now, and I pray you'll help us, each one, to turn to you, to live for you, and the joy and peace that comes from that assurance of knowing that we're pleasing you and we'll be in your kingdom one day. Lord, I pray that for everyone here. Please continue to work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.